Bangwa kesane Just show me then go you hold that dance everyone and welcome to the second press conference of IFFR's Tiger competition. We are streaming live from a studio here in Rotterdam and each day we highlight some of the 14 titles that are part of this year's Tiger competition. The flagship Tiger competition is IFFR's unrivaled platform for emerging film talent with a distinct and modernist voice. Today we will be speaking with the directors of Acrome to love again, Access Will Save Us, and Malintin 17. We will present each film and filmmaker for 10 minutes individually, followed by a Q&A session with all the filmmakers collectively. So, dear members of the press, please send in your questions via the Q&A box below your video screen. If the questions are not featured during this press conference, we will follow up with you via email, which also means that you should not forget to share your contact details. And now, without further ado, let's get started. First up will be Acro by Maria Ignatenko. This poetic and visually arresting film is a grim and pitch black portrayal about two brothers who joined the Wehrmacht during the Nazi occupation of the Baltic states. The film is set in a world of shadows where the stern gloom has an icy but also calm beauty. Its misty palette works as a metaphor for blurred lines between the good and the bad. With evil lurking in forests and stately churches, the question arises, can someone surrounded by violence remain innocent? It's my pleasure to introduce to you two the filmmaker Maria Ignatenko and Asil Kamal, who will translate for us. Good morning, Maria, and thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. It's, okay. <laughs> it's great to have you How with are us. You? Yes. So let me start about the grand question, actually. Um, the film is about the Great Patriotic War, uh, and this is probably the most uh, ideologically complex and artistically diverse genre in Soviet cinema, as well as uh, post-Soviet cinema of Russia. So was facing up to this part of film history intimidating to you or more inspiring in the sense of nobody ever showed it like this? Скажите, пожалуйста, вот самый такой большой вопрос. Ваш фильм, он о Великой Отечественной войне. И вообще это целый отдельный жанр, жанр советского кино. Скажите, пожалуйста, вас это больше пугало или все-таки больше вдохновляло, что вы решили сделать именно такое кино в этой тематике, в этом жанре? Расскажите об этом, пожалуйста. Мы все ищем какие-то способы говорить о прошлом, ищем новый язык для того, чтобы говорить о важных вещах, о которых необходимо говорить. Well, we are all looking for the ways how to talk about the past. We are set on this track of looking for the language about of about the things we need to talk the past. Коллаборационизм и Холокост это те вещи, о которых необходимо говорить и которые в том числе на постсоветском пространстве, ну в каком-то смысле табуированы, и поэтому 
я как режиссер пытаюсь найти новый язык для того, чтобы говорить об этом и говорить о прошлом. И, кстати, книга Рутева Негайте «Свои» тоже работает на этой территории и пытается говорить об этих вещах. And, uh, Racism and uh, Holocaust. These are the topic which are, so to say, taboo in the um, former Soviet Union space. And therefore, myself as a film director, I was trying to find and look for that language, how to talk about this past. And uh, the book of their own uh, by uh, Rutsev Vatsukaitis is also about it. And it's also on the uh, way of looking for that language, which has been an inspiration. И я говорю, я пытаюсь говорить в этом фильме даже не то, чтобы с позиции страха или вдохновения, а с позиции своего незнания и какого-то тумана, который окутывает прошлое. И я смотрю на этот архив и понимаю, что в этом архиве может быть ошибка, и я пытаюсь думать о том, как можно говорить об ошибке в архиве. And, uh, you know, when um, I think to myself, intimidating or inspiring, I look at the past in that fog. And uh, there, I suppose that in the past, there must be that archive. And I, as myself, can see that maybe there is an error, there is a mistake. What if, if it's there? that mistake in the archives. So these are the general settings and the ideas. Yeah, I find this very, very interesting. Yes, as you, the way you talk about it. So what I would like to perhaps expand on, because you have mentioned the book yourself, uh, can you talk a bit more about the novel, uh, Ruta Vanagaita's novel, the film is based on? Um, what about it got to you the most? And uh, perhaps even more so, is there something to its style that directly shaped your film's aesthetics, given that it's so particular visual style that you're using in the film? Я поняла, я поняла, отвечу. Прежде всего, в книге Рутта Ванегайта меня поразила ее работа с архивом. Она не только нашла уникальные архивные свидетельства, но также она нашла, например, записки преступников, которые рассказывали о своих снах, рассказывали о своих фантазиях, и этот материал абсолютно поразил меня. Yes, I understood the question, so I will reply directly. Well, speaking about that main point which struck me about this book is the archive. She uh, was able to find and dig into the eyewitnessing and the handwriting notes of the people who uh, were there, of the, uh, the ones who were tortured. Um, their dreams and their fantasies and what they've seen. So I would say that these are the things which were the main point, which struck me the most. Что касается формы фильма, нет, форма фильма никак не, от, не имеет отношения к книге. Uh, если говорить о форме, то uh, эстетика фильма ближе к поэзии uh, Паули Целана. And in terms of the form of... And in terms of the form of the uh, film, no, it is not directly related to the book. Um, let's say the aesthetics of uh, the film is closer to the masterpieces, to the poetry of uh, Paul Tillan. For example, the Paul Tillan of Fuga Smerti is also built свидетельствах на архивном материале, при этом она абсолютно, это стихотворение абсолютно поэтично, и оно так же, как и многие другие произведения, является ну, таким памятником Холокосту. Я стремилась также в поэтической манере uh, говорить об этих вещах. And uh, the famous uh, piece, masterpiece of uh, Paul Tillan, The Fug to Death, It is also based on the um, eyewitnessing or on the testimony of what had happened and of the disaster, but it is in a very poetic mode. 
and it's a tribute to Holocaust in my film, in my movie. That's the approach that I have uh, taken as well to display it from the uh, poetic point of view. And as the film is about uh, collaborationism in the Baltic region, did you uh, try to find interested parties for the film in Lithuania? Uh, how did that? Did you have any collaborations and uh, partners there? Скажите, а вот по части как раз сотрудничества в целом балтийские страны, да, коллаборационизм. А вы пытались найти, может быть, в Литве партнеров, тех, кто будет заинтересован там с вами участвовать, помогать и так далее? Ну, этот вопрос, наверное, лучше было бы задать продюсеру. Я как автор, как режиссер, ну, в своем как бы творческом смысле искала коллаборацию, например, в каких-то прибалтийских э, литературных произведениях, и в том числе вдохновляясь Рута Венегальте. А что касается э, вот этого вот сотрудничества, то это, наверное, лучше спросить у продюсера. Well, in terms of that type of uh, collaboration, I believe that the film producer will be the best one to answer because I myself, as an author, as a film director, I sort of uh, reached out for that type of collaboration in the Baltic state literature, Ruta, uh, which I've mentioned already, mm. and the other the literature was to me my type of uh, collaboration. So, Вы знаете, then... еще oh. интересно, я хочу сказать еще один момент. Вот интересно, что в главной роли в нашем фильме главную роль исполнял не актер, а Гоша Бергал, и в процессе съемок выяснилось, что у него есть очень серьезные прибалтийские корни, и в этом смысле, я думаю, что как бы коллаборация и... Какое-то какое соединение с прибалтийской фактурой – это такой вопрос, на самом деле, ну, и метафизически тоже. Поэтому мне кажется, что, что мы нашли какие-то связи с художественным подтверждением. But uh, speaking about, let's say, collaboration and that relation in general, I would like to mention just one last aspect that uh, Gosha Bogal, who uh, plays a character in the movie, we found out during the process of filming that he and his family also has some Baltic roots. So therefore, that was that type of uh, collaboration with a Baltic factor, if you will, in general in the sphere. So metaphor or uh, figuratively, yes, we did that direct collab with this uh, end, yes. Indeed, and I think my question was also embracing this whole, uh, you know, approaching it in a more wholesome way as well. We have very uh, short time left, but I do want to ask you one question that really is for you as a filmmaker, and uh, it's because I feel that Akrom is also asking a similar question as your uh, first feature, which is, can there be forgiveness? So um, what uh, makes you wrestle with this question so much. Да, вот как раз таки в целом, да, мой вопрос был о взаимодействии, о связи, о коллаборационизме и так далее. И вот последний вопрос, у нас не так мало, много осталось времени. Вам вопрос как кинорежиссеру. Я думаю, что этот вопрос, он витает и в вашем первом, вот том самом продукте, есть ли прощение, можно ли простить. Во втором фильме, в Ахроме, он также повторяется, и тематика прощения, отпущения, она присутствует. Это личный вопрос. Вы себе его тоже задаете как личность? Он вас волнует? А, да, меня волнует этот вопрос. И мне вообще кажется, что прощение, возможность прощать, это вообще ну, какая-то базовая, 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 какая-то базовая вещь, которая есть у человека, и возможность прощать как-то рядом, наверное, идет с возможностью, с умением просить прощения. Всем. Yes, indeed. Uh, this is a question which is touching me deeply. Forgiveness, the ability to forgive. I believe that it is a very basic, basic underlining condition of a human being. And again, it comes very close with the ability to ask for forgiveness. That's all. 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to continue this conversation and I'm sure we'll get a chance, but we'll come back to you. Uh, Maria Ignatenko, thank you very much again. We'll see you at the Q&A uh, with the press. And uh, now onwards to our next contender. The second film we will discuss today is To Love Again by Gao Linyang. In this feature debut, we follow the elderly couple, Li and Nie, who are facing up to death. While figuring out future burial arrangements, they quietly discover the deep wounds from the past. Never sentimental, but realistic and beautifully framed, To Love Again captures the mentality of a generation who scarred by their past, try to keep their families together at any cost. Let's welcome filmmaker Gao Linyang, who will be joined by translator Miguel, Miguel Fio. Hello, it's really good to see you, you and thank you for joining us. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's get to it right away. Um, and it's again, I'm starting all with big questions today, this morning. Um, why, why would you, uh, as a debut director, want to deal with, uh, with death? Um, what uh, attracts someone comparatively young to the elderly and their world? Uh,首先我从一个比较大的问题开始吧。呃,作为这部,这是您的第一部片子。呃,作为一个年轻的第一,拍了第一部片子的导演。您怎么会被死亡这个话题被吸引？怎么会想到去拍老年人的生活呢？OK，呃，因为我本科是在学习中文的，对，同时呢，我从小的时候是跟我的姥姥姥爷以及爷爷奶奶生活在一起，对他们
Um, I would like to talk to you here a bit more than about uh, the space in which you have decided to set your film in. Uh, and I share that again comes from very personal experiences as well. But what really uh, I found quite striking is how meticulously you have constructed the apartment in which the film is taking place, as well as used, you know, the editing and the mirror to deconstruct it yet again. Can you can you talk to us a little bit about that process? Um, 好像我们也谈过这个问题，就是有时候沉默，呃，使大家更喜欢沉默而不喜欢对峙，这是一个经常在反复的这么一个话题。在在中国的电影当中，呃，另外呢，我还想谈一下关于呃这个空间的问题，就是怎么处理空间的。我想这个可能跟您的个人经历也有一定的关系。让我印象非常深刻的就是您非常细致的布置了这个呃这个房子的布局，然后用了镜面还有剪辑的一些特殊的方式来处理空间。OK， 呃，为了去能够还原两个老人的生活，所以我们在找景的过程当中呢，呃，找了很多的房子。那最后我们选择这个房子，其实就是曾经有两位老人在这里生活。呃，这个房间当中呢，正好它就有很多的一个很多的镜子，对，所以在拍摄的时候呢，我们其实是利用了这个房间本身的一个构造。去捕捉这两个人的生活的状态，因为他同样关于过去嘛，这个故事，所以其实过去往往是，呃，很难以去直接的被看到的，所以我觉得镜面是表现过去的一个很好的方式。In order to um to make to bring the life of old elderly elderly people to life, uh, we looked for. Lots of different houses in which we could make this film.、Um, we finally settled on a house that had actually been lived in by a couple, an elderly couple in the past. And in that、uh, house, in that particular room where we made most of the scenes, there were lots of mirrors in the room. So we decided to use the mirrors and the structure that the mirrors provided to capture the life of this elderly couple. Because, of course, the film is also about the past, and it's very difficult to portray the past in a very direct way. We felt that by using mirrors, that would be a good way to portray the past as well. Yeah, it was、uh, really quite an impressive way of structuring. So compliments on that for sure. And、um, now we are going to actually be focusing more on you because、um, what、uh, what was the experienced screenwriter Gao Lingyang's most worried about?、Uh, About with regards to the plans and ambitions of the first-time director Gao Lingyang, it's a very different set of experiencing. So I'm wondering, did the knowledge that you'd direct the script yourself influence your writing as well? Uh, 非常赞扬您这个镜面的这个使用在片子里头，我觉得给我留下了非常深刻的印象。我现在想谈到您本人，嗯、um, ，我知道您之前是也是编剧，嗯、um,。那么，怎么会从一个编剧到一个拍摄第一部片子的导演？这个经历是一个什么样的经历？然后为什么会从编剧转移到导演这个工作上？呃，其实，呃，并不是转移，对，是我一直以来一直想做做导演。其实，在之前的经历当中，呃，在写《野马分鬃》的同时，其实我就一直在。呃，筹备再团圆这样一个电影，所以两个项目可以说是在同时的进行。对，呃，他们各自其实，呃，对我来讲，《野马分鬃》是一个青春片，但其实对我来讲，老人有些时候也像小孩子一样，有不留遗憾的地方吧。所以，这个我对我来讲，可能是另外一个一个青春片。所以其实他们是同时同时进行的，对。It wasn't really a change from screenwriter to director,、um, because I always wanted to be a director. But also while I was writing the screenplay for Striding into the Wind, I was already preparing the the groundwork for To Love Again. So these two projects were going on at the same time. But also to me,、uh, of course, Striding into the Wind is a film about youth. 
But I also think that to love again is to a certain extent also about youth because elderly people are often very like the young in many senses. Um, they have no regret. They don't want to have any regrets in life. So this film to love again is also about youth on that level. Well, on that beautiful note, uh, I want to thank you very much, Gavin Yang, and uh, members of the press. Do send your questions to the filmmakers via the Q&A box underneath this screen. And uh, let's move on to the third film of today. The next title we will discuss is Access Will Save Us by Morgane Jorla Petit. A young filmmaker returns to her home village, a small hamlet in the north of France, to investigate a strange story about a terrorist threat. Well, she didn't need to look much further than her own family. Following on her 2019 short, Access Will Save Us is a playful, sometimes unsettling, yet mostly pleasantly perplexing reflection on the division between the countryside and the urban regions. The result is a striking mockumentary and a portrait of a dysfunctional, dysfunctional yet likable family that deals with the fear of the other in a rural community. It's my pleasure to introduce the filmmaker Morgan. Thank you for joining us today. Bonjour à toi. Thank you. It's lovely to see you. And uh, let's start with, uh, actually this time, a very simple question. So why did you give this film the same title as an earlier short of yours? Because it confuses Google a lot, I may tell you that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, well, it, the, the feature film comes from the short film uh, and is actually, the beginning of the feature film is kind of the beginning uh, of the short film. Uh, but also, as I wanted to uh, uh, use uh, this thing with the short film being in festivals inside the feature film and the discovery for my family that uh, they can become famous or watched and loved, um, then it felt logical to keep the same title. So we can just say, oh, Access Will Save Us has been released and it becomes really funny and meta. and. The title still applies uh, with the inhabitants believing that excess will save them in some kind of way. Yeah, and uh, the meta element to it is quite present, I know, because I want to continue on that, which you just mentioned between the short and the feature. What is uh, the re relationship between them uh, also in terms of production? Because as you said, I'm, uh, I'm asking this because there is a, a of the Clément Ferrand sequence, which uh, suggests that you were already busy, right, with the feature when uh, the short film started hitting the scene. Yeah, but that was reenactment. <laughs> <laughs> <I thought so>. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was wondering, I wasn't sure. Yeah. So now we have the yeah. answer. Yeah. But uh, we, we had the short film one year earlier to the festival, but then it was the funniest thing to come back to this festival and have my dad screams to everyone that our film is now at the festival and you have to go to the theater to watch it. And uh, I don't know how people took it, especially when uh, we was uh, in the theater room with them and telling them the film that you're going to watch now, I am in it. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I guess people discovered that he wasn't, or maybe believed that he was an extra that was extremely motivated about the film. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, yes, we we started to shoot the feature film like one year after all the success of the short film. So uh, I, I can imagine there was a lot of confusion, uh, not only with the title of the film, but where is it playing, when and who is in it? So maybe this brings us to our next question. We heard your father is in it. So how did you find uh, some of your protagonists? Uh, well, we know that uh, few are, are a relative of yours, but not all of them, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, well, the film is uh, really about uh, finding how you can become your own self inside the family and uh, how the family can be a weight on that freedom to be your own self and as a filmmaker coming back to the village i felt quite free uh, in the sense that i chose to be there so to reflect the feelings that i had in my childhood of feeling stuck in the place 
uh, I wanted to use other characters and therefore mm -hmm. I created a fictional cousin that is in reality quite a mirror of myself, but uh, younger. And my dad, who, when I came back for the short film, I discovered always felt stuck in the family. And so I thought it was an interesting mirror to use to <laughs> these two people uh, with a very long age gap. But you see that uh, if you don't try hard to resolve the problem, you, you never do. And even if you're 60 years old, you can be as stuck in your family as a 17 years old. Yeah, you're not wrong about that. You either deal with them or they're going to come back to haunt you. So you find a good way of doing it through creative processes. But tell me a bit more, how did you get everyone to participate in your project? It's not uh, a given that uh, perhaps, uh, you know, you just say a word and everyone jumps in. Or maybe that was the case. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, at least... Uh, what did you have to promise? Yeah. Like the people that we see uh, in the film, uh, definitely uh, from the beginning, they were really motivated to be in the film because I, I, I didn't want to, I mean, it's already hard to make a film with your family. So you don't want to risk more things by putting people who have doubts on being in the film or not. So I just used people who were really sure about their participation and were really motivated. Let's talk about the film, actually, the making of the film itself. Is, the, is this the film, now that you look at it, uh, is it what you imagined you'd make when you started developing the project? Or uh, if there were any changes, how did it change during the making? In its essence, it's really what I imagined. But then the stories were much further than I imagined in the beginning, because yeah, I wanted to not be in that bubble uh, of shooting uh, that we are usually when we make a fiction and really uh, be open to the reality coming uh, constantly. And so I could be open to what my family would tell me of what happened to them in reality. And suddenly it was crazier than what I had written. So uh, I was implementing the stories into the things that I had written and uh, and uh, of course, I mean, in the middle of the shooting, the pandemic happened and yeah. suddenly it became also a mirror to how people feel stuck suddenly because they are literally imprisoned in their own place. And then uh, things become even crazier than before. So there are things I didn't plan, but there are still good mirrors or motives of uh, what I had imagined the essence of the film would be. There are some uh, participants who, when we look at the end titles, playing characters and others who are simply themselves. So uh, what would you say it's real average between uh, acting and performing and actual behavior or real life circumstances in the film? Yeah. Wow, that's a line I'm not even sure I can show myself. <laughs> Maybe that's the best answer. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it's really too complicated. It it went in ways that I, I cannot divide it anymore, and I like it in that way. Yeah, that's also I think what we like very much about it. But uh, tell us a bit more, perhaps. Then uh, how did you work with your protagonists? Uh, did you, for instance, just set up a space for them to perform, or did you decide to direct them more strictly or sternly? Uh, it depended on the scenes. Um, more serious scenes, we had to repeat a lot. And uh, sometimes it was a struggle with my dad to do the takes a lot. But uh, more comical scenes, then I try often I try to direct them the first time. And then I see they do a much crazier thing that uh, I didn't predict at all. And then that makes me laugh so much that even if it's over the top, if it makes me laugh, uh, I want to see that because I, I love the surprises and uh, I love for the viewer to be surprised too. And I think that, that became the best way to direct them in a way to be open to the surprises they would give me too. Well, surprise, I think, doesn't even begin to describe your film and what a joy it is to, to watch it. And uh, I'm wondering, did, the, did your family see the film or the protagonists in the film? Have they already seen it? Uh, what is the final, the final result of it? No, we have the premiere today at the cinema. So we're going to watch it uh, today in the cinema together. And I can't wait. And I can't wait to sit next to my dad and just watch him during uh, the <laughs> full time of the film. 
I'm very <laughs> curious about those reactions. I wish you good luck and I thank you, Morgan. We will see you again later at the Q&A. And now on to the final title of today. The last film we will discuss today is Malintzin 17 by Mara Polgowski. For seven days and nights, Mexican documentary master Eugenio Polgowski filmed a pigeon on its nest built atop the power lines outside his apartment. Together with his daughter, he watches life go by. Polgowski's sister Mara found the footage after his sudden death and edited it into a sensitive and intimate film that is both his and hers. The result is an intimate and philosophical documentary. It subtly ponders the way nature is forced to adapt to ever-expanding human infrastructure. Simultaneously, it forms a disarming portrait of parenthood, of father and daughter finding a connection in their shared view of the outside world. Hello, Mara, and a very early good morning to you, and thank you for joining us today. I mean, it's dark, behind this, you know, we can see in the background that there is, uh, you're calling us in the middle of the night, so thank you for braving it us and being here with us. Thank you, Vanya. Happy yeah, to be we'll... here from the city. <laughs> If I'm, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, your brother was working on more than just one project at, uh, at the time of his death. So um, I, I wanted to perhaps start by this. Uh, why, why did you choose to, uh, this one as the first to finish? And I'm saying that because actually I'm already assuming that you will want to finish uh, others as well. Yeah. No, that's a great question. I feel that... Um, Partly, I was just more directly moved by this material because it's a material that in a way, you know, while I was mourning, uh, you know, missing him because of his sudden death. So this material kind of brought me very close to him. Uh, uh, inevitably, when I was editing, I was listening to his voice absolutely all the time. And, um, and I think kind of it kind of made sense to start with this very intimate project to then move on to other perhaps more universal, um, uh, you know, films that deal, for instance, with, you know, drug dealing or, you know, or, uh, or there's one, another more minimalist project that has to do with, you know, trees. So this one just felt right at, at that time of my own life and, and process of, of, of positioning myself before a very beautiful, complex, and fully developed body of work of, you know, established, and as you said, documentary master. So also, I could position myself very clearly in this project as a sort of the triangle between, or, or the square between the bird, my niece, Milena, and my brother. Uh, the other projects, in a way, have such diversity of characters that my own position will be harder to find and I'm still looking for that. Yeah, and this uh, also I think uh, it it's, uh, brings me to my next question which is very much about your experience because you're ma mainly uh, a performance artist and academic specialized on performance sound. So how much was filmmaking something new to you in the in the hands-on fashion in contrast to watching your brother at work or maybe lending him a hand every now and then? I assume you had some experience also with him before? Yeah, interestingly, when I was 19, so before I started uh, university, I, I did study um, screen, screenwriting with Beatriz Novaro. Uh, and, um, and then I kind of left that aside and became a, a companion or a witness of my brother's career. So I was always very much present during his education at um, CCC in Mexico. So I, I basically was present in all of his projects when he finished uh, Tropic of Cancer. Well, when, when he was doing it, we, we were editing together. I was just there next to him, you know, like it was something fun to do. Then that collaboration became more serious because I would often um, collaborate in the process of conceiving the projects, writing them, putting uh, together kind of funding applications. And then even uh, we did uh, work together on two commission films and we, we traveled to Kenya and I was, you know, the script writer as well as then 
assistant editor or you know it's hard to put names to what i was doing because i was really present throughout the process as a witness i'd say so after the fact of his disappearance uh physical disappearance i kind of was very familiar actually with editing and with writing and so I, I had been to film festivals with him you know um pitching projects so it was just this strange feeling of solitude of course of not having him as as a as an interlocutor to mm. carry on uh, i mean i am sure that he we would have done this film together if he you know he was with us i would have been there but I th we, we would have also done a different film um, yeah. And I was reflecting on how this film is different to what, what he would have done. And Eugenio was a very, very committed environmentalist and, and all his projects deal with social issues. I think in this case, he was really, truly moved by the temporality of a bird and, and how, you know, they, they, as you say, they need to adapt to modernity, to the violence of urban life um, in, a, in a context in which we're living a sort of Armageddon already environmentally. And um, so I think he would have focused much more on the bird. And I think my, obviously, my impulse was to focus much more on him and Milena. And you said yourself, uh, perhaps you would be doing this film together as well. Uh, and uh, and you had a lot of insight in the past, but also with this film itself as well. So. Did you did you have any materials to work besides the footage? Was already there some kind of an assembly or notes, or you had to sort of come and complete uh, and imagine it yourself? It was all new, and I like the the the, mater the footage was organized by day, and I kept a daily structure. But it, there were more days of shooting than I ended up um living in the film so the film has seven days and seven nights i was thinking of genesis and you know kind of this symbolism of, of the number seven and while well, the, the shooting is actually longer uh, but there were no notes about what he would have wanted to do whether he would have actually done a film with this material you know he he was filming a lot of, of like all the time basically so there's there could be more than three four five potential films so uh the fact that i kind of did believe that this could become a film um was my decision ultimately as well as um yes giving it a shape i, I was also obviously all, everything i did was was listening like w while i was working i was always trying to listen to his voice and and remember his aesthetic convictions that were very very clear so you know, while I was editing also with, with Pedro Gonzalez Rubio, my co-editor, we were wait, watching scenes of the inheritors of Tropic of Cancer and often modeling our editing according to that. So it was listening, often listening to dreams of, you know, trying to communicate with Eugenio. And at times that communication worked, at times it didn't. But it was ultimately a process of invention from scratch. Uh, that made it challenging, uh, but also, um, you know, rewarding now that the film is completed. Yeah, with, uh, which is exactly, I mean, from what you say, it's, in that regard, it's quite a unique process. So, um, and I'm sure you had to go through a lot of uh, sort of different experiences and processes yourself, because I wonder, you know, did you try, I'm sure that has been something that, uh, you know, um, uh, you had to go through uh, perhaps at the beginning, you know, uh, trying to av uh, avoid involving your own sensibilities and uh, mm -hmm. ideas into realizing the work. Uh, perhaps, you know, is it that you something you thought of going through to make yourself something like uh, like an instrument of your brother's ideas? Or you, you know, slowly, you know, le leaped in head on and, uh, and said, well, I can't even guess what Eugenia would have done, you know, with it. So I'm just going to do my own thing as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, I originally, I first really only wanted to be an invisible hand. I, I often use that metaphor, you know, although it comes from a very different <laughs> tradition, but the idea of the invisible hand that completes something. Um, that, in, interestingly, it was also my previous role in Eugenia's work, like to be yeah. invisible. Like, you know, I would often be helping him in every aspect, but I didn't desire anything else than 
his work to be wonderful and which it, it always was. So I, I didn't really aspire to become a filmmaker at all or to have any kind of um, media visibility or success. Or it was really a sort of ethical commitment to him. We were very, very, very close. So it was like, you know, brother, you're not here to do it, but I'm going to do it. Don't worry. It's no matter how much it costs, you know, because of course there were moments in which it was challenging to, to also do it. I, I have my full-time job. I'm not a professional editor, so I did have to actually like learn more editing. And, you know, there were moments in which I felt like, what's this all for ultimately? Um, but um, so, so I, I did have different feelings about how to position myself. But after really like three years of, of working with the material, I was so immersed in it that I felt almost like I had been there in the shooting. I, I, I know it so well that I was no longer hesitating of, or, or even tracing lines between what was Eugenio or me. I mean, I think we actually also thought very similarly about film we also had very similar ideas about, um, you know, the, the values that we have and that we want to convey, and uh, also the aesthetic of, you know, for instance, uh, the film. Interestingly, although it's very intimate and you know family oriented, it actually has very abstract moments mm. that I think were something Eugenia and I were sharing much more, like leaning towards almost experimental film, and um, and I, I think. If Eugenio and I work, despite the fact that I had a different job, lived in a different country, because we shared a, a sense of the aesthetic, we, we had a similar feeling of what worked or didn't. Yeah, and uh, and I think you very very successfully conveyed that on the screen, especially the the, the shared you know idea about this. Uh, uh, as you say, more experimental visual aesthetic because it conveys such uh, strong values and sharpness to it and uh, and we can also recognize it as well. So I want to thank you very much, Mar Mara, for this inspiring conversation. And now we are going to move on to the questions from the press members. As a reminder, the Tiger jury who are currently watching the films on the big screen consists of five members. Juji Bankuti, Rust van den Berge, Tatiana Leite, Tekla Reute and Farid Tabarki. The jury will grant three prizes, the Tiger Award worth 40,000 euros and two special jury awards worth 10,000 euros each. The Tiger competition winners will be announced on February 2nd during our awards ceremony. And now, time to get to some of the questions from members of press. And let me dive into this little screen here and look them up for you. So we are going to go in the, uh, in the same order as we started with the press conference. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, the filmmaker Maria Ignatenko from Acrome. And go with the following questions. It says, excuse me just a second, um, it's quite a sentence, so bear, me, bear with me while I'm reading it. Uh, it says, a chrome is a visually arresting film with a very special dark net palette, which is not colorful nor black and white. Can you comment on the visual cinematographic concept of the film and its meaning? Да, спасибо. Прекрасный вопрос. Я поняла его. Визуальная концепция фильма напрямую связана с его темой. Мы пытались понять, как мы можем смотреть на прошлое. И вот это ощущение, что прошлое туманно, что прошлое бесцветно, что, что в прошлом очень много каких-то каких темных пятен, и привело нас к созданию такой концепции. Yes, thank you. I understood the question, so I will um, answer directly. Well, this whole topic, the topic of the past, the past in the fog, where there is no color, it is colorless, and uh, there are many dark spots as well. So that is why the um, visual conceptualization of the movie is as such. 
Соответственно, название фильма также напрямую связано с концепцией фильма. Ахром, ахроматические цвета – это черный, серый и белый. Они не являются частью спектра, но при этом именно цвет, эти цвета, добавление этих цветов дает оттенки всем остальным цветам. And um, it is also directly related to the name of the film, Ahrom. Ahrom, black, gray, and white. These colors are not the colors of the uh, spectrum. However, adding these colors, that exactly would gives the shades to different colors. Когда мы думали о концепции фильма, мы смотрели очень много живописи и фотографий, и во многом эстетика фильма построена на фотографических картинах Герхарда Рихтера. And uh, when we were thinking through the concept of the movie, the conceptualization, we've been through um, a lot of art and uh, images, photos. So basically one could say that the aesthetics of the film is based on the uh, photos of Gerhard Richter. Можно на самом деле долго говорить об эстетике фильма, наверное, имеет смысл продолжить. Well, we could endlessly talk about the uh, aesthetics of the а, film. Знаете, я скажу еще одну вещь, очень, очень важную, что не только визуальная, не только, uh, визуальная часть фильма связана с, например, ахроматическими цветами, но и звуковая часть. Например, в фильме есть uh, определенный звук, который соответствует белому цвету. Yeah, so we could um, endlessly uh, speak about the aesthetics of the movie, but wait, 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 let me just chip in one more thing before we move forward. In addition to the uh, visualization concept and that uh, achromaticness, there is also an additional part to it, the sound. Because in the film, there is that sound which is correspondent to the white nose, which builds even a fuller picture of the uh, film being achrom. Well, it's very true. We could, when you make such a compelling film, we could spend hours talking about it, and it definitely deserves so. But uh, we are also gonna thank you very much. Ha have to move on to the next questions from the press, and uh, here we are gonna address uh, the filmmaker of uh, the uh, film To Love Again, Carol Ling Yang, and. Uh, um, it talks about the cast, and uh, you're gonna have to put, forgive me for butchering your actor's name. So it says, uh, you have cast uh, Lie Shu Jian as a, a magnificent uh, actor with an impressive career in Chinese cinema, in the main role as the husband. Can you tell us more about why did you choose him and what does he, according to you, brings as well to the role? 我想问的一个关于这个演员的问题，呃，具体一点呢，就是李雪简这个演员为什么会选择他？呃，他当然是一个非常有非常优秀的演技生涯，在中国，呃，为什么会选他作为这个片子里头的主要角色呢？ I'm not sure if we can hear you. 好像听不到。听不到声音了 来去诠释这个角色，可以说对我来讲是非常幸运的一件事情。同时，在拍戏的过程当中呢，呃，他也给了我很多我在剧本当中没有想象到的一些处理。啊，这个处理我在剪辑的过程当中会发现，啊，他
academic roles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he's a very versatile actor, but also at the same time he was also one of my idols. So that's why I asked him if he'd be willing to be an actor in the film, and he said yes. So I was very lucky to have him as our main actor. Also during the filming process, he gave me a lot of ideas as to how uh, to 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 sort of uh, tweak certain things in the film based on that screenplay that I wrote. Well, what a great privilege to have your idol, uh, you know, acting or taking uh, such an important uh, place in your first film. And uh, not only that, but someone that you can also take so much knowledge as well from. This is really a true gift, I can imagine. Well, I want to thank you very much. I'm sorry. I'm you have your own idol, you can participate in your own film. It's a very exciting thing, especially as it's in your first film. Yeah. 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 I want to thank you very much for your answer, and uh, we are a bit short of time, so I'm gonna now move on to uh, to Morgan, the director of the film Access Will Save Us. And it says the following, uh, despite the heavy topics um, and overall apocalyptic mood, uh, and then it says as well, reinforced by the outbreak of the pandemic, which you talked about a bit uh, yourself, it says there is a lot of humor and slapstick. Uh, why this approach? <laughs> Uh, because they make me laugh a lot uh, in my family and I think that it's a way that we found to communicate together so it felt like the best way to make the film too. Uh, I, I don't think all of this would have brought us so close together if it wouldn't have been some comedy in the film and we wouldn't have laughed so much. Uh, because also comedy is usually the only way we manage to speak together uh, it's by making jokes at the farm that that we can say things so yeah it felt like yeah i think it works like a coping mechanism as well of sorts right yeah yes yeah thank you very much morgan uh and now uh, i have a question for mara the director of malintzin 17. um Okay, it's a, it's a long one, bear with me. It says, Malintzin uh, 17 has a very careful editing that opens up us very personal images uh, to a variety of more universal, philosophical, and social themes. When you, when you saw the footage, did you recognize this profoundness immediately? And uh, can, you, can you talk about, uh, about this process indeed? Indeed, the, the profoundness, the depth is in the footage and it's in Eugenio's gaze uh, because, you know, the experience of living with Eugenio was like he would watch, he would see, we would be walking in the street and, you know, see an eagle and like immediately turn that into kind of a metaphor of something rather, you know, universal. And, um, and so the way he shot was that, was, you know, if, if you, you, know, you see a mother walking with her daughter, it, it seems unimportant. Then you realize the daughter is attached through a cord, just like a dog. So what is that telling us about the relation between parents these days, you know, protection? So, so actually, every, even the more everyday kind of on, on sublime or on interesting image, actually seen from Eugenio's gaze is, you know, so full of depth and so full of complexity and that's very much present there uh, so my 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 work was not creating this depth but enhancing it you know making it everyday and obviously weaving it together giving it the right pace um and yesterday i was talking to my sister and we were talking so is it more eugenio's film or my film and we were really concluding that it was impossible to conclude like to, it's very much a collaboration like um you know the film wouldn't have existed without the footage the film but also without my work so we we just went back and forth debating what brought uh who brought what but i think the depth is is something that very much was carried by eugenio and his handheld camera yeah 
and I think it's great also that then we also leave it at that uh, at that interpre interpretation that both you know delivered and contributed to film you know in a way that you can't say you know who you know uh, dissected anymore in this way and I think this is also the beauty of it well thank you very much Mara and maybe now you can go and uh, <laughs> catch some sleep as well um, so thank you to all the filmmakers for joining us today and thank you all for joining the conversation this is it for today if we didn't get around to your particular questions, we will get back to you later via email. So also please do get in touch with IFFR Press Office to arrange your one-on-one -on -one interviews with the Tiger Competition filmmakers and other talent. We will see each other tomorrow again to present our third press conference with EAMI, METMES and Kafka for Kids. Meanwhile, also enjoy the rest of this year's program through our partners at Festival Scope Pro. Thanks again and see you all tomorrow. Just show me then go you hold that dance.